Hello, welcome and thank you for joining us today at our next law enforcement briefing. This series has been designed as a knowledge sharing platform. As we know, it can be hard to stay on top of all the new technology on top of everything else that you have to get done in your day to day work. Don't feel like you need to make notes or take it all in straight away as we'll be sending out a recording of the webinar later today. And you're also welcome to share that recording with anyone else in your organisation who you think might benefit from it. Also, if you have any questions, please do feel free to drop those into the Q&A box at the side at any time. And there will also be a dedicated time for questions at the end of the webinar. So let's take a look at the agenda for today. So Bedrock have recently been awarded the contract to provide a fully managed public space CCTV service for Cumbria Constabulary. In addition to managing the full service from cameras to data storage, Bedrock will be providing appearance search technology to improve the effectiveness of police operations across the county. We'll use part of their story to talk you through how we can deploy CCTV networks using our UK based private data centres. So a little bit about Bedrock for those of you who might not have um, been aware of us previously. We're experts in secure, resilient networks and managed IT solutions where high performance is critical. We work with some of the organ some organisations that have some of the highest security requirements in the UK. We have worked with almost every UK police force and all the work we do is completed with the aim of helping police use technology in a way that aligns with their operational requ requirements. We also have accreditations and partnerships with vendors such as Milestone, Bosch, Motorola, etc. So we can get you any of the tech you need. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Michael Crabtree, our senior technical architect. Over to you, Michael. Thank you very much. So yes, uh, thank you, Jenny, and uh, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to another law enforcement briefing. Uh, as Jenny said, um, we're going to be looking at um, a. There we go. We're, we're going to be having a look at um, some of the network systems and some of the uh, some of the solutions that we're utilising uh, as part of our work with Cumbria Constabulary. Uh, we're going to be working uh, on their overt CCTV um, and we'll start off by looking at some of the challenges. Uh, they've got a large number of overt cameras. They're distributed across the whole county of Cumbria. Um, they currently do have overt events. They will use separate systems to the overt system CCTV system that's already in operation. Uh, just to give a bit of background on that, that system, uh, there is a system already in operation that we've been running for approximately eight years. Um, and the tender was to uh, upgrade that, bring in new technologies uh, and new developments, as well as do the usual type of network and IT type refreshes that may happen. Um, one of their other challenges is the ability to view video. It was confined to a single building with only a couple of uh, clients being made available throughout the rest of the county. The original infrastructure installed by the councils uh, was no longer fit for purpose. Things like fiber optics and other sets of connectivity have basically been left so that they, they no longer worked and therefore the solution had to use some quite creative ways of delivering that video back to originally the headquarters and as you're going to see shortly in the webinar uh, into our data centers and back out to where they uh, where they need it. Um, the other key challenge here is also the stark differences uh, between the different types of broadband and internet connectivity available across the county. So a quick look at the solution. There's 89 cameras, currently 56 static cameras, 23 4G based uh, remote deployable cameras. Uh, these are all deployed across 15 different towns and cities all across Cumbria. Uh, the, the intention is that they're all going to be delivered resiliently uh, to two private cloud data centers in the UK, and these are going to be managed by UK eyes only bedrock engineers. Uh, the intention is delivering high quality video directly into the dedicated monitoring unit and emergency dispatch desks, so they've got the ability to have some eyes and ears on the ground as soon as possible. We're also bringing something quite new to the market, which is the provision of access to some of the best post processing and live analytics directly into the milestone client. Uh, so they've got that there available to them uh, should they need it. Uh, 
what we're also doing is providing real time access to live video to staff on the ground, either via web browser, mobile apps and those types of things. So if they do have officers on the ground, they've got the ability to to be viewing that video uh, before they even get to the scene. One of the other things that uh, we're going to be working with them on is the ability to export footage directly out into Axon evidence.com. Uh, I know a few people may use that. A few people may use other different types of uh, ingestion into CJS, uh, but that's what these guys use. So that'll be straight built into uh, Milestone for them. So some of the technologies behind that. We're going to be leveraging that compute power, the availability, that resilience of the private cloud. Um, we're going to be going some detail that specifically uh, as how we're leveraging that for these guys. Um, we're going to be using SD1 to help deliver resilience to and from key areas, and that's really going to make the way we've been doing things so far for these guys uh, quite a big game changer, which is fantastic. We're going to be using Milestones VMS as that central point for video and for analytics for delivery to the CGS, like I said. And then we're going to be using Briefcam to be able to deliver advanced analytics to the people who really need it. We have a little bit of a look at the private private cloud. Um, obviously, we've done a couple of, we've done a webinar on this and we can send you that if you need a bit more information. And this is a bit of a whistle stop tour, if you like. So private cloud is a model whereby the infrastructure, the platform services as well. So the actual applications are delivered alongside a service package taking away any of that headache of hardware and software management, any of the maintenance, any upgrades to systems, failures, and also the refreshing of systems that, you know, sometimes you have to do every five years or so, and especially when things become end of life. So our data center in Manchester, that's a, a, a police assured secure facility. Um, what that essentially means is a couple of key things in terms of our certification. So we run to ISO 27001. It's also BS5979 certified. It also has an on-site police linked ARC, and it's the only R that meets that BS5979 standard. The other thing about it being a PSF is it gets physically checked by the National Policing Information Risk Management Team, which is a bit of a mouthful. But yep, the, those guys go and check that out uh, once a year, usually just make sure everything is as it should be. A um, couple of questions from our last webinar. I think one of them was, well, um, what standard or tier do you guys uh, have at your data center? There's a little bit of a graphic on here that just show the various tiers from tier one, which is a really basic equipment in a rack somewhere, give or take, up to uh, some of the higher levels. We are a tier three, so we're expecting to maintain a 99.98 uptime uh, with multiple paths for power, so resilient grid connections, um, its own substation on site, high capacity diesel generators that give 100 hours of runtime on those generators alone, um, separate cooling systems for and things like that, fire protection, all the standard things that we would expect in terms of systems and resilience to those systems so we can make sure we're protecting the, the hardware that's there. Also device diverse internet connections as well, uh, running at 10 gigabits per second, so we've got lots and lots of throughput um, and that's based with tier one ISPs. So uh, so we've got direct connection right into the backbone of the, the Internet and the World Wide Web. Um, so yeah, we've got some big power and some big security behind all that. What does that mean? That means that in terms of scale. We've got the ability to uh, to scale up. So if we need to add more resource to things such as servers and PCs and things like that, uh, we've got the ability to do that. We've also got the ability to scale out and add more hardware if or add more virtual hardware if you like um, as required and I'm going to talk about that a bit later on with some of the other systems. Um, so the current scale is for 56 cameras and 23 remote deployable 4G cameras as I said um, and at the moment that equates to around about 80 terabytes of storage which we're going to be replicating. So if we have a look at uh, what that might look like is a little bit of an overview, a very basic overview. Um, so we've got our two data centers We've got a total of around about eight towns that are, are linked in via raw bank connectivity. Um, the other towns are based on remote deployable uh, as part of a partnership with the councils. Um, it was really the most um, effective way of, of getting them um, video and cameras directly into the data center um, or directly uh, onto the system um, rather than putting in a whole set of, of infrastructure. 
uh, into that town. So you can see here the idea, this is just one town as an example. If that's got 12 cameras, um, the way we traditionally would have done it is effectively have four internet connections. So we've run three cameras on each. Um, that would also require for, uh, for internet, but also for firewalls, four sets of connectivity into the, uh, the data center or the headquarters. Uh, we effectively run that as four separate networks. Um, for those people who know, it's delivered via VLANs, so we are technically using one network, but it's effectively four virtual networks. And if one of those internet went down, then three cameras would go off. So we were really just um, managing the risk on a failure. Now, with SD-WAN, we can reduce the amount of hardware. We can go to a single firewall or dual if we want to use high availability in a key area. We can connect all that internet connectivity and different types of connectivity directly to those two, one or two devices. Um, we can make, we can have lots of um, kind of rules and things set on how we deal with that. So we can send the cameras down the different sets of connectivity. But what we can also do is set lots of rules for failure. So in the event of an internet going down, we can then take the cameras and spread them across the remaining set of connectivity to maintain connection. Um, and the same goes for our management as well. Um, our management will be running down one of those sets of connections, uh, bring you event of a failure that'll just move and will remain. And we will be able to connect to that and uh, deliver the same amount of support as what we did before. So absolutely key. Adding to the resilience is our two data centers. So uh, we'll have both sets of connectivity. We'll be able to uh, connect to both at the same time and make the video available to the uh, to the operations room, um, out to their clients and PCs via either data center. Um, another addition to that is their mobile browser clients as well. Again, we can connect them to either data center in order to uh, connect to the video and get those live streams. So for those people who just haven't really seen Milestone before too much, uh, this is a very quick overview of some of the components. It's very much component and modular based. Yes, you can install lots of these components on a single box, um, but in larger deployments and in deployments where we want resilience, we would not do that. We'd put them on separate uh, virtual boxes, if you like. Um, and that way we can control each element and make it available from either data center. And in terms of the graphic you just got at the bottom, pretty much everything below the center black line um, in terms of servers, management, recording, all those are all in our data center. Uh, the milestone mobile client as, uh, server as well, that is also in the data center. And that means that we can uh, pretty agile in where we deliver the, the video and data um, out to the clients and the video walls as they see fit. So we'll have a look in a little bit more detail in terms of the data centers. Um, we may have seen this graphic before for those people who have uh, joined one of our previous webinars. Um, but what we've got there is the is the milestone components broken down. So we've got our SQL service, we've got our databases uh, replicated across both, available from both, and the same with our management servers as well. Um, from there, we have our recorders in primary and backup. So if a primary recorder fails, we've got our backup there to take the slack. We've also got our mobile servers and that delivery out to the mobile clients. Um, and then something that's new on here from uh, previous slides that people may have seen, we've got the BriefCam Analytics server. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a bit because there's quite a bit of detail in terms of the requirements of that and why it'd be really, it's really uh, useful and really good to have that in the cloud or in our data center, should I say. Um, something new, uh, and this is new to Milestone in the latest 22R3. Um, is the ability to authenticate via the Azure AD. Um, so in this case, for mobile clients, uh, we still want to make sure that we're authenticating those clients properly um, and be able to them to be managed. And of course, for some people, if you, uh, I'm sure I've got a few people maybe administrate some systems, uh, looking after users um, can be quite a, an arduous process, especially if you've got thousands of them. So one of the things that we can do is we can uh, make connectivity to Azure AD uh, and Cumbria have been quite leading in the use of that. Um, so basically they will be able to control their users at that point um, and then they will be able to use their normal force um, users that they, they log into the force PCs with uh, on their mobile clients and browsers and have access to the system and be able to view the data. And then day to day we can manage those groups of users uh, and in terms of the, the content that the, they can get to and they can access. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, we've been able to do that with um, 
with the domain. So for example, creating a trusted relationship with a Foresight uh, domain, we've been able to do that for a while, but what's really new, and especially on that mobile side, uh, is the ability to use Azure AD, which is quite exciting for us. So let's have a little bit of look at the BriefCam Advanced Analytics. So why is it really good and why is it really you know, a fantastic thing to be using? Um, it's got some innovative technology benefits, but not only that, you know, it's great, isn't it? I'm sure, you know, as engineers, it, oh, I can do this really fantastic, cool stuff and we can search for all these things. But what I actually mean, it frees up key staff time. It cannot, you know, in terms of sitting there, working through hours and hours and hours of footage and things like that. Um, and the increasing from like patrol, patrol time, so if you're not dragging officers in to sit and watch video for hours, they can be out on the, on the front line. Improving intelligence collection, we're able to bring in much more and put together some much, much bigger intelligence packages quicker. Um, we're also do things such as uh, hopefully increase victim satisfaction, improve confidence, and obviously it boils down to hopefully investigating some more crime or being well, which is great. Um, so, what are the benefits of having it in a data center? Um, one of the things is that BriefCam, and as, as is for all analytics, they utilize GPU in order to process, tag, and present the information uh, and allow you to run these uh, rules and other sorts of things against, against the video and put all that metadata into it. So virtually all of them use GPU. Um, obviously, as we know, that can be quite an expensive resource and also a finite resource. So benefits of the data center, um, two things that I mentioned in a previous slide, scaling up so we can give more CPU, we can potentially give more GPU. Um, what we can also do is scale out. So what we can also do is based on brief can be modular. Um, for example, if Cumbria or anywhere um, needed more capacity, so there's been a some kind of you know a murder for example in a city uh they may want to pull and really investigate and, and watch video um so all the cameras from a town for say two three months um how long would that take to process that manually it'd take a very long time and the system and i'm going to talk about the requirement uh, the kind of what the system is going to be capable of um, but if they need required more so the ability to process that quicker uh, what we can undo is we could basically bring online another processing server along with that GPU power and then be given more processing power or run more of that analytical uh, and get more information uh, within the time frame that they require it. So at the moment that is specified to give them 1100 of post processing hours per day on all on, on any camera they wish. So it, one camera for a day, obviously 24 hours of processing. Um, but it, it allows them to do one, about 1,100, um, depending on the size of the video. That's based on uh, HD, for example. Uh, and from that, it will process that, tag it, put all the information into that video, and then they will be, do, be able to do appearance searches, vehicle searches on color and type and things like that. Um, also, other sorts of things that people may have seen from some of our demos on brief cams, such as vehicles driving on the wrong side of the road, um, all sorts of things. Um, the other thing is they want the ability to perform live analytics. Um, there's a camera in an area, um, for example, that for most of the week is just a, norm, a normal road. You know, it's a road with cars on it. There's some pubs down the street. It's that type of thing. Uh, however, on a Friday and Saturday night, that road gets closed. Um, and, you know, there's all the bars and the pubs and the clubs and all that kind of thing there. Uh, and therefore, their needs in terms of uh, analytics uh, differ on that camera. So what they want to be able to do is they want to be able to have a bit of autonomy on that and be able to do things such as look for loitering, looking for congestion in congregation as well uh, in those areas. So if people start spilling out of the pubs into that area and there's a lot of congestion and congregation in that area, then they're able to uh, be able to see that and be able to switch that on, on either via scheduling or manually on, on those times that they want them. And yeah, they can also look for other things such as vehicles in an area, differentiate, for example, between a cyclist in a pedestrian area and a motorbike in a pedestrian area. They can do that as well. Um, there may be some other things such as persons entering and leaving buildings, people present in certain areas where there wouldn't be. All those things that can be performed live. So people might have seen this before. I'll set this running, but um, 
so yeah so there are some more advanced techniques um as we said this is just an example i'm going to put this on the background while i'm talking um with uh, with regards to the types of things that can be done we have done a few demos on this uh, i also did a webinar uh oh gosh maybe six months ago on analytics uh if people didn't get the chance to see that then obviously just drop us a little bit of a line and uh, what we'll do is we'll send you a link to that so yeah this is just an example in the background here of uh, of that and how uh ooh, nearly and uh <laughs> and and how uh, how you can leverage some of your, your searches and that type of thing to make the best use of them there we go so moving on how so how do we support can we please um they have a 24 7 contract with us um they had that under the old system and they're going to have that uh, with the new systems as well with access to our out of hours support team um, we operate a proactive approach to any problems and issues uh, we've got our extensive monitoring tools they're in our own sock that we have um, so we're monitoring all of the systems all of the time so if there's any issues we'll see it and we can hopefully proactively deal with that issue either before it before it becomes a big problem or no we need to send engineers out um, and we also provide a spares package that enables our on-site support teams to be ready for any of those issues and failures, uh, any problems with equipment in any of the towns uh, or anywhere else. We're able to send engineers onto site uh, with some equipment using the information we've gathered from our SOC to be able to go and fix the problem as quickly as we can. Um, and also uh, something we'll be doing uh, new this time, we've been doing it with some of the forces as well, is supporting the CCTV team on over events. As we said already, some of them sometimes get um, looked after separately, sometimes by TSU. Um, and obviously speaking to some of you guys, you know, you do a lot of work and you're working really hard on these kind of covert things that you guys have got to do. And sometimes these things uh, are something that, you know, if some the overt, certainly if, if you can get some help with that, uh, and bring that directly into the central monitoring um, instead of a separate system. That's something that we're we're going to be helping out with uh, with these guys in particular uh, to bring those feeds directly into the control room uh, and then moving forward, similar to some other systems we've been supporting, uh, the ability to bring other third parties connections into council systems, uh, football ground stadiums, um, uh, shopping centres, that type of thing. And, and, and again, bring that into the control room as well. Now, <laughs> we're nothing if not proactive. So um, something that I thought um, it'd be good to bring up during the webinar. Again, if people got questions, they can ask it. Um, obviously, there's been some things in the news regarding the use of uh, certain types of products. Um, and so I thought it'd be worthwhile bringing it up in the webinar. Um, and also deal with facts, not deal with gossip or some you know, CNN or anybody like that. So. There was a statement issued by the government security group um, whereby they felt that additional controls and the use of certain surveillance systems were required. Um, so it actually states that departments have been instructed to cease the deployment of equipment where the company or manufacturer is subject to the national intelligence law of the People's Republic of China. That by association means things like hit vision cameras. Um, and at the, ad the advice at the moment um, so far on that statement, which, you know, is quite short really is that any such equipment shouldn't be connected to government core networks and should be considered for removal from sensitive sites and if there are other sites that are under government use that are considered to be not sensitive then maybe we should look at that do a risk assessment and work out whether or not they should be removed or any extensive mitigations put in place um, and that was issued out on the 24th of November. Uh, I mean, as we all, you know, ourselves uh, and you guys as well, in terms of seeking clarity from from that kind of announcement, um, what we're trying to do is really help people understand uh, what their exposure could be uh, and manage that through auditing, maybe applying security controls and if appropriate, looking at replacements as well. Um, we're going to follow up with some more information on this after the webinar. Um, if there are any particular questions, then please feel free to ask them as well uh, about this or obviously anything else in the webinar. Um, and we'll try and get those answered for you as well. So does anybody have any questions? Yeah, thanks very much, Michael. Um, so as you said, we, we've got our, our time for a bit of Q&A now. So if anyone wants to pop any questions into that Q&A box, 
right now, whether that's in relation to the work that we've spoken about that we're doing for Cumbria or the, um, the, the Hick vision issue that you just briefly touched on at the end there. Um, happy to answer those now or obviously if it's if it requires a longer answer, we can always get back to you um, later today or, or later in the week. Um, I, I've just got to say one thing on on um, one of your last slides. Whenever you mentioned that we keep our support, um, our support and security programs in our SOC, I, I mean, I, I know what you mean, but it always makes me laugh. That <laughs> the fact that it's sounds, called a SOC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> security operations center is that what you're asking me to, to yeah. uh, elaborate on what that means i know yeah everybody chuckles yeah they do um security operations center absolutely yeah yeah as opposed to a uh, an noc or a NOC, which is a network operations center so it's just building on on what a NOC is which is you know uh, management of a network this is management of systems management at all levels in terms of is it on or off or not is it secure or not looking at logs from various pieces of equipment to really understand um yeah, right, okay, cool. Um, and to really to really uh, understand more about what's going on with the network uh, yeah. and the systems and applications that are on it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, just a <laughs> quick insight from Andy. Um, he's just come in. Um, thanks, Andy, for the update. Um, there's a NPCC CCTV meeting tomorrow. Um, where, yeah, I, I assume they'll be talking about heat vision <laughs> and the issue there. Um, we were Indeed. at the um, we were at the AMPR. Uh, conference earlier this week and there was it was definitely a topic of conversation there oh, yeah. so definitely yeah. as you said it's it's one of those things we all need a bit of clarity around what we need to do as our next steps um i think the best we can do right now is is to assess our current positions so yeah definitely yeah um some of the fact you know um about six and, and obviously the government's looked into lots of different areas that would come under what would be classed as a government or even a or even a council or whatever you wish to call it building. Um, I think it was about 30 percent of forces who replied back to for some information said that they used Hick Vision uh, even as part of CCTV for a building um, and, a, and around about 60 percent of schools use it. Um, so it's looking at it's, it's looking at what the risks are like you say you know uh, and, and how they can be either eliminated or or, uh, or mitigated, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And and as you said as well, we will be releasing kind of um, a follow up written document as well, just of helpful advice of things you might need to look at doing or that we can mm. support you in doing um, over the coming days and weeks. Definitely. Mm. OK, um, if we do have any further questions, if you think of something um, later today that occurs to you or perhaps even you, you share the um, the webinar with someone else as a recording and they think of a question that suddenly they, they need to know the answer to. Obviously, we are always here to um, help you answer those questions. Um, happy to jump on a call and talk you through anything that you might need to um, to think through for your organisation. Um, oh, we do have one other question that just popped in. Um, has Mo Milestone Mobile been successfully tested in Cumbria yet? Um, have we got to that stage yet, Michael, or are we still early days? Not with that client, no. We have successfully done the initial tests uh, with another force. Um, so yeah, we've done the testing on there so far. Um, and again, it's important to make that um, uh, resilient and secure. Um, so yeah, we've been doing that, um, working with their mobile team they have a mobile team that specifically looks after their mobile phones um and therefore we've been working with their mobile team uh, in order to test that and make sure that it'll work and work resilient to both our data centers so yeah uh, we have been testing that that's in early test well not yeah. early test actually it's more advanced test um yeah so they'll be doing our on-site testing with those guys uh, okay brilliant recently. Yeah, we know there's nothing more frustrating than something getting rolled out as shiny new technology and then it doesn't work. So test, test, test yeah. is, is. It certainly amazing. is. And it also <laughs> depends on the application of. Um, all right, OK, um, it, it also um, is important with with any uh, with any force like that. You know, the, the mobile or IT teams, they may do things slightly differently and therefore uh, the how we configure that and how we work with that may differ slightly. Uh, whether we connect via the force. Uh, which is some we do, or whether the force say actually we'd like you to connect directly to your data center. So there's different methods and therefore we'll have to, we'll have to do different types of testing. Mm. OK, great. Um, if you could just jump on to the next slide, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> um, that would just give you a couple of dates to look out for in the new year. 
So our next law enforcement briefing will take place on the 23rd of March. Um, Cara is going to drop some links into the chat now just so you can sign up for these straight away if you want to get it in your diary. So yeah, that's the next law enforcement briefing will be on the 23rd of March. But before that, we will also be joined in February by um, one of the experts from Milestone who will be talking us through alongside Michael mm -hmm. um, the latest updates to Milestone XProtect. So three times a year, Milestone release these updates. And quite often we find that forces aren't aware of the updates or they don't know quite how to use them properly. So to make sure you're getting that full functionality out of Milestone and, and everything you're paying for, uh, we're going to launch this new series of webinars that just tell you all of the updates coming to Milestone XProtect so you can start using them in your organisations as soon as possible. So once again, those links are in the um, announcements box right now. If you'd like to go ahead and sign up for them, you can do. Um, and, and we'll also be emailing about them closer to the time as well. So you won't be missing out, don't worry. OK, without um, yeah, with, that, with, that, with all that said, I think it's time to for us to wrap up. So thank you very much, Michael, for your time no today. Problem. Um, and as I said, if you've got any further questions that you would like us to cover, um, feel, please do feel free to email them. Um, I'll be sending out the recording of today's webinar by email later today. So you can just reply to that if you think of anything and we will happily set up a call um, between you and Michael so that we can um, talk you through any issues you might have. Indeed. So we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye. Thank you very much.